Well, we've been going through uh, the, the book of Matthew on a series called Follow Me and looking at the places where Jesus <clears throat> has reached out to people and invited him to become uh, his followers. And this is the last in that series. And for six weeks, we've really two things that I keep reiterating that I see. And the first one is, is that Jesus' call is absolute. He wants all of us, all of them. Not some, but all. And it's an absolute call. And that's just kind of a hard thing for us to, to grab a hold of. But the second thing is, is that the people that he called, um, most of them never did really understand. Uh, well, let me say that differently. None of them understood really who he was. Nor did they understand his mission as to what he was doing. Until uh, after the resurrection. And thankfully, we get to the resurrection today. So I want to read this passage out of Matthew 28, uh, verses 1 through 10. Now, after the Sabbath, towards the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothing white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he has risen, as he said. Come see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. See, I have told you. So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and said, Greetings. And they came up, took hold of his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. Well, we end this, this trip through Matthew uh, with the account of the resurrection and it is, without a doubt, the most startling event in the history of humanity. And it's also the linchpin of our faith. If this did not happen, we have no reason to be here at all. And I don't want us to take this simple thing of the resurrection, you know, take it as a simple thing, because the resurrection, it, it really remains a, a really difficult thing to kind of understand and, and comprehend. John Orberg, who was uh, an author and a pastor, told the story. He said, "A woman looked out. <coughs> excuse me. A woman looked out her window, and she saw her German shepherd shaking a rabbit. You know, and so she knew it was the neighbor's rabbit. She ran out with a broom and beat the dog until he dropped the rabbit on the ground. And you know, this is a disaster because she and the neighbor are not real good. So she takes the rabbit inside and she." puts it in the sink and cleans it all up, you know, and takes out her hair dryer and blow dries it and gets it all fluffy back. And, and she sneaks over into the neighbor's yard and opens up the cage and puts it back in the cage and kind of props it up there, you know. About an hour later, she hears all these screams coming from the neighbor's yard. And so, you know, she goes out, she goes, what's going on? And, she, and the neighbor says, our rabbit, our rabbit, he died two weeks ago. We buried him, and he's back. <laughs> be a good trick to play on somebody with a dig up their pet. People in the ancient world knew that dead rabbits stay dead. And it, it may have been the ancient world, but they were not dummies. And they knew that rabbits don't come back to life any more than what people come back to life. And probably the preeminent New Testament scholar right now, N.T. Wright, he said there were many messianic movements in the first century. Did you know that? Jesus was not the only messianic movement. He said there were many messianic movements in the first century. In every case, the would-be Messiah got crucified by Rome as Jesus did. In not one single case do we hear the slightest mention of the disappointed followers claiming their hero had been raised from the dead. They knew better. The story about the resurrection of Jesus is not 
something that you make up is my point. This is really ridiculous then as it is now. So today, just for a few minutes, I want us to look at this one verse here, the response of his followers, these women, as they encounter their master for the first time in his resurrection body. And it kind of shows us the final thing that we need to know as to how to follow Jesus. So just verse 9. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. At first it says they came up. Well, that, that sounds kind of simple, kind of insignificant maybe. They come up to Jesus, but there's more here. I mean, this is a drastic change. You see, the followers have spent days running away from Jesus. It, uh, they're in the Garden of Gethsemane. Remember, the Gospel of Mark notes that they all fled. Those are probably the men, but they all fled. They all ran away. And some had said, we'll follow you to the end. We'll, we'll never leave you. It was, it was Peter who said, I'll never leave you, Lord. And uh, he did. He denied him three times. There in the Garden of Gethsemane, as the sins of the world were being laid on Jesus, Jesus asked them just, just to wait with me, just pray for a little bit. And they couldn't even do that. They, they slept and said, so when it came to following through on the mission, they were going the other way. They were not following after him. And Jesus knew that this was going to happen. This was planned. He even told them that this would happen. He said, you will all fall away. And Peter said, no, not me. I'm going to the end. And of course, he didn't. But that was the way it was supposed to be. You see, because they all weren't supposed to die with Jesus. Only Jesus was supposed to die. And if they all follow with him, they would all be crucified along with him. Isaiah 53, 6, one of these uh, messianic prophecies, the whole chapter of, of uh, 53 in Isaiah is the suffering servant chapter. But here Isaiah says, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. One perfect sacrifice was what was needed. Jesus was enough. They all didn't need to die. Only Jesus needed to die because he alone was perfect. So he didn't need the 12 to die for him. He didn't need all the other disciples to die. Uh, just one man. One man who was like us in all ways and yet had never sinned, never done anything wrong. Now, I want you to make sure that you, this sounds simple, I know. But I want you to make sure that you get this this morning because I'm not sure that we get this most of the time. Because a lot of times, even as Christians, we live our lives still trying to do something for God to convince Him that we are good enough. Still trying to complete what Jesus, we think, didn't do enough of. And yet He is enough. The cross was enough. The covenant that God made with you is in the blood of Jesus. It's not in your blood. It's in his blood, not yours. And that's why he insists, as we started off this lane, he says, my yoke is easy. My burden is light because he's the one that does it. We don't do it. So the disciples, they, they hide from fear on Thursday night until Sunday. And they're full of guilt. They've abandoned their Messiah. He had called them friends. They betrayed their friend. They, they hid in the crowd as he was uh, being displayed by Pilate as to whether to be crucified or not. They kept a distance as he hung on the cross. But now Jesus comes to these women in his resurrected body, and they come up to him. They approach him. See, there's been a turn. Now, I, I, say, I say this often, but let me say it for you again. At any given moment, we are either turned away from God or we're turned towards God. At any moment in your life, it's not one turn, but it's constantly a matter of which direction you are turned. Following God means that we are turned towards Jesus and we come to him when he seeks us out. We turn to Jesus the first time, but there will be millions of other turns that we make to him daily, weekly, as we get distracted, as we believe a lie. As we become fearful, we turn away. 
then he calls us back. The things that, that keeps us uh, turned away from him, things like shame, things like guilt, things like fear, things like lies, they all blend together to shout to us that, well, uh, we're ruined, we've, we've committed an epic fail again, uh, this time it's just too much, you know. Uh, the little lie will come to us that, well, you know, even God won't forgive that. That's, that's just one thing too many. That's the lie. We think, all right, can't turn back. Just, just forget about it. It's over. And then Jesus appears, and he's alive, you see. And we turn from our shame, and we turn from our guilt, we turn from our fear, and we turn from the lies of the world, and we dare believe that Jesus was enough that his death was enough for us. And we don't need to die for that because he already had. Well, let's go back to verse 9 again. Take the next section. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. Now, the women literally touched his feet. They took hold of his feet. Don't, don't miss this today. Jesus was not a ghost. It was not a hallucination. His body had form. It had substance. He was, as they said, the new Adam, the first new man. And we have a lot of difficulty, uh, you know, our logic-seeking minds with getting, you know, really, you know, he was dead and now he's in a new body, and I don't know if I can buy that, and that sounds just, you know, really kind of mystical, ancient, hocus-pocus kind of stuff. But what we're doing when we do that is we're trying to place the miraculous within the realm of the laws of nature. And miraculous never fits within the laws of nature. Some people argue that miracles like the resurrection, which is the greatest miracle possible, are impossible because nature is a closed system and miracles would therefore violate laws of nature. There's a, there's a man in named John Lennox, who explains it this way. He's a professor over at Oxford. And he says that Christians don't claim that Jesus rose by some natural process that violated the laws of nature. Instead, Jesus rose because God injected enormous power and energy from outside the system. And he explains it this way. This works for me. Maybe this will work for you. He says, suppose I put $100 you don't have $100, maybe $10. No, we better use 100 That's why I got written down here. My math's terrible. Uh, suppose I put $100 in my drawer in my office, and then the next day I put another $100 in my drawer in the office. Now, the laws of mathematics says 100 plus 100 equals 200, obviously. But on the third day, I open up the drawer, and there's only $50 there. Well... What do I claim? Do I say, oh, all laws of mathematics have been broken? No. I know that there's been a thief in my drawer, right? Somebody's taken $150 from me. Some force from outside the laws of mathematics have gotten into my drawer and taken $150 out. He says the laws of mathematics, the laws of science, can't stop the thief from getting in my drawer, right? He goes on to conclude. He says in the same way, the resurrection of Christ and every other miracle doesn't negate the laws of nature. The resurrection shows that someone has reached into the drawer of history and removed something, the sting of death here. So unless you have evidence that the system is totally closed, you can't argue against the possibility of miracles. Now, I believe the system is open. I believe that there is power beyond the laws of nature that can break into the system any time that he chooses. And mess with it. Jesus proved the system is not closed. Jesus proved that God is still at work. God is still redeeming the world. God is still cleaning up the mess that we made. Jesus was real. And they took hold of his feet that day. But there's another way to look at this and understand this. They not only physically took hold of him, but they also took hold of him in the sense that they grasped who he was and what resurrection meant. They took hold of this new reality, a new world. And then once you grasp that Jesus Christ is, in fact, alive, the world can never be the same. You can't go back. This changes everything. Tim Keller, a uh, minister that I follow quite a bit, 
told the story this way. He said uh, there was a pastor in Italy, and he saw a grave of a man who had died centuries before who was an unbeliever and completely against Christianity, but a little afraid of it too. So the man had this huge stone slab put over his grave so that he would not be able to be raised from the dead because he wanted to stay in the grave. And he had insignias put all over the slab that said, I do not want to be raised from the dead. I don't believe in it. So we had this big, thick stab of slab of stone and all these insignias, you know, I want to stay in this grave. So evidently, when they buried the man, when they dug the grave, an acorn fell into the grave and an oak tree grew. And an oak tree grew up through the crypt and busted the thing open. And there in the middle of this man's grave is this tree that comes out from the middle of the grave. So the minister looked at it and he asked, if an acorn which has power of biological life and it can split a slab of that magnitude, what can the acorn of God's resurrection power do in a person's life? And Keller adds to this. He says, the minute you decide to accept Jesus as Savior and Lord, the power of the Holy Spirit comes into your life. It's the power of the resurrection, the same thing that raised Jesus from the dead. Think of the things you see as immovable slabs in your life. Your bitterness, your insecurity, your fears, your self-doubts. Those things can be split and rolled off. The more you know him, the more you grow in the power of the resurrection. When we take hold of Jesus, when we understand the resurrection, it changes life. Remember, Jesus says, because I live, you will live also. And he's not just talking about after you die. He's talking about right now we have life. Now, the last part of this, this uh, verse, verse 9, says, And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. This third action of the women when presented with the risen Lord was that they, they worshipped him. Literally what this means was that they fell flat on their face in front of him, just like John in the Revelation passage that I read. That's what this word means, to prostate oneself. They laid flat on, his, on their face. They bowed down to the, to the ground in reverence of a deity. This is the first place in the gospel accounts where it's recorded that the followers worshiped Jesus. Before that, they'd been inspired. They'd been impressed by him. They'd been amazed by what he had done. But nowhere does it say that they worshiped Jesus until here. And here they fall on their faces at his feet in complete surrender to who this man is. Whatever concepts they had about him before that moment are now obsolete because Jesus has revealed himself to them as he really is. And the first time they understand that he is not a prophet, he is not a teacher, but he is in fact God. He is the great I Am. And they turn from running away from him they grab hold of who he is, and now they're before him in worship. And, you know, I propose that you can't really worship Jesus until you worship the risen Savior. You can admire how kind Jesus is. You can admire how great of a teacher he is. You can see him as the greatest man to ever live, but you can't worship him until... You see that he's alive, that he's resurrected. The women followers that day knew that he was not just a man, but not just a rabbi, not just a leader or a prophet, not an earthly king. They knew that he was, in fact, God Almighty standing in front of them. And they fell at his feet in surrender. Quite... Honestly, we in American culture take the resurrection kind of calmly. It's, it's, uh, it's a holiday, but I'm not sure that we understand the reality of what this means on a daily basis. It's become so familiar, perhaps, uh, that it being life-changing or shocking is maybe lost on us. What if... What if we were grabbing hold of Jesus for the first time? What if today was the first day that you heard that Jesus was raised from the dead? You can hear all the rest of the story. He was a great man. He, he changed a lot of people. 
He, he, he went and he died for people. But what if today you heard that for the first time that he was alive? The Jesus movie, I don't know if you've ever seen this before. It's a movie that they show in third world countries as missionaries do often. And oftentimes they'll go into a tribe or a village that's not heard, doesn't have the Bible, never heard the story before, and they'll set up a screen and they'll show this movie of the story of Jesus and they translate it into their language. And in East, Af East Asia, some missionaries did that and they showed the Jesus film and one of the missionaries was telling the story um, he says, one unforgettable evening, they, they saw the gospel in their own language. First time they'd ever heard of this. So, so imagine how it felt to see this good man, Jesus, who, who had healed the sick and everybody loved and never rejected anybody. The, the greatest man that you could ever imagine. And then he's on trial for something he didn't do. And he's beaten by these jeering soldiers. And as the tribe people watch this, they got really upset and they start talking back to the screen. They've never seen a motion picture before. They start, start talking back to the screen. And then they began to, to demand that everything would stop. And when nothing happened, then they turned on the guy that was showing the, video, the movie. And then they, they start, you know, getting angry at him and demanding that he stop it. And so uh, he was forced to stop the film. And then he explains, he says, listen, it's not over. There's more to the movie. You need to see the rest of this movie. There's more to it. So they settled back onto the ground and holding their emotions in check. And then came the crucifixion scene. And oh gosh, the same thing happened again. They started getting really upset and, and talking to the people and crying and wailing. And he had to stop the thing again and say, you know, there's more to this. Just, just be patient. Finally got him calmed down. And they sat down on the ground. Then came the resurrection. And just pandemonium broke out. This time, for a different reason. The gathering just spontaneously erupted into this party. Where they're hugging each other and patting each other on the backs. And, and he said, it's just deafening. And he has to stop the film again. Because they can't watch it. They're having so much fun in this party. All this is supposed to happen in the story of their lives was happening. Okay? Is that what we would be like if we heard for the first time that Jesus was alive? Would we just break out into a party? Would it just be pandemonium, just spontaneous jubilation for us? You see, we can get rather callous with this old story, can't we? So the ladies, the first followers, they come to him, they, they respond, they, they respond to his call on their lives. They take hold of him. He's real. He's alive. We accept who he is. And then we worship him. He's God. Not just a teacher, not just a great man, but he's in fact God. Is that enough for you this morning? Can you take that home with you? Let's, let's pray through this for a minute. As deep cries out. 